Hello and welcome to Change is Possible podcast. My name is Ani Filipova and I'm your host. When I left my banking career to try something new, the number one question everyone asked me was, how did you find the courage? The thing is, it's not about the courage. It is about knowing what you want and planning for it. That's why I started this podcast to help you make your career change possible. Each of our guests have done a successful career change and we are going to discuss practical advice, actionable tips and inspirational stories that can help you to get unstuck and transition into work that you love. Let's get started. Hello everyone. My guest today is Raquel Focardi. She is a leading expert on generational diversity and a best-selling author of Reframing Generational Stereotypes. Raquel was born and raised in Italy, and she spent her professional life between Europe, USA, and Asia. Since 2003, she was uh, spearheaded the employer branding movement globally, advocating that organizations and governments should incorporate an employer branding strategy into their workforce planning. After a very successful 16 years career at Universum, she was their chief strategy officer, Raquel decided to pursue her real passion, bridging the generational divide. She started by writing a book, Reframing Generational Stereotypes, which, by the way, became a bestseller. And she started XYZ at work to help organizations adapt to the needs of the new generations and foster a culture of intergenerational collaboration. She lives in Singapore and she has three children. Hi, Raquel. I'm so happy to have you today in my podcast. How are you? Hi, Annie. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. So you have an exciting career with many changes and turns and twists. And I can't wait to talk about it, but let's start with the very beginning. What was your first job? How did you start in the world of work? How did I start in the world of work? Well, I was always uh, very high energy and, and quite ambitious. So I actually started working uh, when I was in university. I'm originally from Italy, but I went to study in the United States. I was studying in Texas. And even though I was obviously very blessed, my father was sponsoring my education and taking care of me. I just wanted to get going. I always had this feeling that I wanted to do things. And so my very first job was actually, aside from, you know, your babysitting gigs and, you know, all these kind of things that a lot of youth does or do when they're in college, I decided to work as an office manager for my journalism professor. So one of my journalism teachers, brilliant, brilliant woman, Sally Sharp, she also had a, a, an office building that was, I guess, back in the mid-90s or late 90s, what we would now consider a very, very early version of a workspace, of an open workspace. Open a, space, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically, or a co-working space, maybe even better, okay. a co-working space. And so she rented different offices to different companies from your uh, real estate agents to your architects. And so I would spend every time that I was not in school, you know, managing the office, you know, answering the phones, organizing things. And so that was great. And then I would spend my nights as a copy editor for the Daily Texan, which was the newspaper of campus for $19 a night. Wow. I would work from 7 p.m. until about 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> copy editing the newspaper. And uh, yeah, so I guess those were my two first jobs. You studied journalism, right? Yes, I did. I studied journalism. Okay, that was a, a natural choice to have these jobs, right? But what was your plan? What did you want to become when you started uh, school and after you finished it? What were your dreams? Well, I think that's a really good question. And I think that actually this question is at the foundation of the work that I'm doing today. To be honest, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and I was raised in Italy and started my life in Italy. And the reality is that back then, at least when I was a teenager, there wasn't a lot of guidance around what career opportunities you could have. There wasn't a lot of reason to really think, 
what do I want to prepare myself for? I think this is something that started happening with the following generations. I mean, Italy, you know, when I was young, was obviously a country that had an incredibly high youth unemployment. And the idea is that having any job, <laughs> even a job that you hated, was still a luxury. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there was not a lot of guidance in terms of this is what you should think about as you progress in your studies. This is the university degree you want to pursue because this is the career you can have if you do that, or these are the problems you can solve if you do that. It was mostly kind of identifying what was closest to your natural dispositions and then hoping that at some point down the line, you would be able to find a job that would be able to put some of your natural abilities to the test. So if I have to be completely honest, I didn't really have much of a plan. I knew that I loved to write. I was always extremely curious. So for me, reading everything about anything was just a passion. And so I naturally connected the dots and thought, okay, you know, I like to write. I'm curious about the world. I want to be able to express myself and somehow inspire people through my story and the stories of others. So, you know, journalism sounds like the right, <laughs> right choice. Little did I know at that time that it wasn't exactly the type of education that would lead me to, to that job, but I thought it was a natural transition, let's say. I see. Yeah. And talking about Italy and what it was at this time, I was older than you, not by a lot, but still older. And I was born in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, but we had the same, you know? So I never thought I want to be a banker at all. At that time, it was like, oh, banking and finance is fashionable. So what is the admission criteria? Oh, you have to have a test in geography. And geography was favorite subject of mine. So I went and I was admitted. This is how it happened. So very similar story. Absolutely. And what happened after that? I saw that you were CNBC anchor. Yes. I guess that's like an amazing dream job. So how was that for you? Was this what you were looking for as a journalist? Is that the best thing that the journalist can get? I mean, to be honest, for me, the idea of ever becoming an anchor woman was something that was, I mean, more than a dream. You know, it was it was almost a, a utopic thought. Also, because I actually had not been able to get into the broadcast journalism program when I had applied. I got into the, the print journalism. And so for me, you know, the idea that I would one day end up becoming an anchor woman for CNBC was not something that I really saw as an easy possibility. But I think one thing that has always characterized me is I just have this kind of sense of, of faith in life that somehow, you know, opportunities will open up in front of people if they're meant for you. So when I actually graduated, I decided to leave the United States and move back to Italy, which was a very difficult decision for me because it created a lifelong rich with my father. He disagreed with the idea that I should move back to Italy, thought that I should stay in the United States and work there, that I would have better opportunities there. But of course, you know, you're 21 and you <laughs> think you know everything. And I was very committed to making my way back home. So I kind of found myself having to figure out how to get a job and how to support myself because at that point he kind of cut me off in a country that I knew very, very little about. And like I said, in Italy, you can't afford to be picky. And so I tried a lot of things to get different jobs. And ultimately, I actually had to go to a, a temporary agency. And uh, they managed to connect me with a advertising agency. And this is now, you know, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. And so, you know, of course, I had U.S. education. So I was extremely ambitious, ready to go, spoke English fluently. So I, I started working for this advertising agency. And again, this was another pivotal moment in my life because I experienced for firsthand the dreadful conditions that a rookie or a young talent or a young person with zero experience had to endure on the hands of you know older colleagues back in that day, and especially in a country like Italy. And this is actually important uh, when I think about my narrative because it did inspire me to bridge that generational divide and write my book uh, many, many years later. But I started working there. I had an incredible amount of ambition. Unfortunately, that ambition was limited to serving coffee and making photocopies. Every <laughs> attempt I ever made to step outside of that, asking my boss to please let me be in an internal meeting, to please let me work on something meaningful was actually met with massive scoldings and even threats of, of being fired because I needed to keep my place. 
And so I didn't believe it. You know, I thought that there was more to life than that. And I wanted to do something different. And so I decided to move on. And uh, I had the opportunity to work, to meet the owner of what is now one of the strongest communication consulting agencies in Italy. Mm -hmm. And he was a young entrepreneur who set up this incredible company, working with incredible clients. And uh, I started working in corporate communication consulting, which, of course, was not journalism per se, but was very linked to that. Right. So I was leveraging my skills in public relations. I was working with incredible clients and I was doing wonderful things, to be honest. And I think that this man was one of those kind of guardian angels that enters your life at some point and really helps steer your life in one way or another. Because one day he came to me and he said, listen, Rachel, you're doing incredibly well and we would hate to lose you. But I just have this feeling that you're meant for bigger things that you're getting a bit tight here. And, you know, I was a journalist in my previous life and I am, you know, in connection and connected to CNBC, CFN, CNBC in Milan. I know they're looking for someone with, you know, international experience and ambition and to work as a paid internship. And I think he would be amazing. And so I thought, okay, this is wonderful. And uh, I went and I decided to take that meeting. And that's wow. kind of how things started. It was uh, it was an interesting story there too, on how I find myself on air. But that's kind of how the connection happened. Wow! It it shows how important it is to have the right boss and work for the right boss who is actually there to guide you the way and not to just uh, give instruction, do this, do that. Right? It's so important. So what happened after that? You had a great run in CNBC, and then then you changed entirely and started into the world of talent management, right? So it, it is quite a turn. How did it happen? Did you plan this transition? Uh, you know, I have many other questions. Let's start with this. How did yeah. it happen? No, absolutely. I think it's a great question. Well, so what happened is, yes, I had a great run at CNBC. It was an incredible experience. I, as I said, joined as an intern. My role was to support the live So basically the main anchor of the channel that was sitting in London at the time in my role was to be there in the director's seat supporting her through the live uh, shows and, and so on and so forth. And I had an amazing career. I loved it there. I ended up having my own TV show and, you know, becoming a, an anchor for, you know, big part of the day. But unfortunately, you know, it was Italy, right? So there was still a lot of nepotism. There was still a lot of discrimination. There was still a lot of, frankly, even, even harassment. And, you know, when it came to being a woman and being young and being able to, you know, advance rapidly, you know, there were always people that were ready to speculate. And so I got to a position where I loved what I was doing. I mean, I was so passionate about it and it was so incredible to, to be doing that. But I just felt that I wouldn't be able to advance much more than that. And I was 23 years old. I was incredibly ambitious and I wanted to do something that mattered. I wanted to, to test myself and my boundaries. And so actually I made a very, very important and I guess uh, risky or brave decision, which was to go back to the United States and try to see if I could finish pursuing my MBA and then figure it out from there. And of course, this was after 2001. So it was hard to get back to the US and to be able to get a visa and to be able to work. And so basically, I left my, my job at CNBC to go back to the United States and wait tables. So for six months, I decided to go back to Texas, which is where I graduated from. And while waiting to apply to university and get into a uh, MBA program, I was waiting tables. So I was working at two different restaurants, you know, from morning to night and trying to put some money aside and figure out, you know, how to reinvent myself and reminding myself every single day that sometimes you have to take a step backwards to make a leap forward. And during that time, I actually had the opportunity to connect with the owner of Universal, which was then my employer for 16 years. And they, you know, Universal was an employer branding company. And this is also very interesting because, you know, life is a matter of synchronicity and a matter of synergy and a matter of connection. So when I worked for the communication consulting company, my biggest client was Monster and Adcom. Adcom at the time was the employer branding advertising branch of Monster. And so I learned when I was 21 years old what employer branding was. And I learned that there were not only companies that were paying their employees, which was something quite unheard of back in my day, <laughs> but there yeah. were also companies that were willing to invest money to 
make people happy, to make employees happy, to attract the best talent, to become the type of organization that would be able to cater to their needs and their dreams. And that's when I fell in love with employer branding. And so I supported Adcom with a lot of their employer branding campaigns. And my role was to build awareness around this employer branding concept. So I fell in love with it. It was just fascinating to me, the idea that, again, the workplace was transforming simply because there were organizations that were inspired enough to realize that happy employees are are better employees, that a better workforce benefits everybody. And so I always had that in the back of my mind as something that I thought could be, you know, extremely transformational, especially because my own experience had been so lousy, frankly, when I first entered the workforce. And so I remained with this idea in mind. And when I was, while I was waiting tables and waiting for the next thing to happen for me, I was writing articles and I was kind of working on some consulting projects. And then I contacted, uh, you know, Universum, And they came back to me and I connected with them and they said, yeah, well, we're running an employee branding project. We don't have a full-time job, but, you know, we have a project that we need somebody to run. And if you're open to flying from Austin to Philadelphia tonight and be here tomorrow, (laughs) you can start. (laughs) And I had never really heard of Universal, honestly, until then. And I just thought it was, you know, so interesting that I would be asked to just fly with no contract just, you know, going and and doing it. And I decided that I had to do it. I had made a good friend of mine a promise that as soon as I would get the first opportunity, I would take it no matter what it was and show the world what I was made of. And so I thought, let's do it. So I I opened up a suitcase and I put in a pillow and a duvet and some clothes because I had no idea where I would sleep. And I arrived in Philadelphia where I started working with Universal on a big employer branding project. And uh, at the end of this project, it was right around the time when millennials were entering the workplace, organizations were reinventing themselves and launching their employer branding practices. And I was asked to stay and set up a, a consulting arm of the organization in Philadelphia after the project was over. And I took it. And that, you know, was the beginning of an incredible journey for me because as as you mentioned earlier, I was with that organization for 16 years and it really kind of helped me gain all the insights, the passion and the opportunities that have now allowed me to do what I'm doing with organizations and to write my book. Wow, that's a fascinating story. I guess that with everything that you were, you know, a journalist, you had a lot of skills in writing, you know, connecting with people, etc., you probably had side hustles in the talent management world. Did you, I guess that you had developed speaking engagements, training, coaching. Can you tell us a little bit about this, how people can develop side hustles, things that you do alongside your main job? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think obviously being able to pursue, you know, areas of interest and being able to continue to build upon your existing skills is extremely important. I have to say that, you know, with Universum, I was lucky in the sense that it was one of those organizations that was was growing. It was a very entrepreneurial environment. And I don't think that it was very clear what direction the organization wanted to go other than being front and center in this employer branding movement. And so there was a lot of openness to bring in people with different skills and potentials and then giving them complete free range of motion. So it was not one of those organizations that would kind of park you in one spot and help you build your career from there. It was most the kind of organization that says, you know what, the world's your oyster, whatever you're good at, whatever you feel you want to do, you can do it. And for example, one of the things that I wanted to do was work with Asia because my family was living in Singapore and I had this dream that I wanted to move to Singapore to the point that I had applied to Deloitte because I had heard from friends that in their human capital division, they would eventually move you or put you on projects <laughs> you know, with no success. And I was able to do that. I mean, within three months of being there, I suggested to the CEO that Asia should be a strong focus. And I was told, you know what, do it, go to Asia as long as you want, stay there for as long as you want, build the market. I had obviously a passion for being on stage and conveying messages to people and and sharing and getting everyone aligned behind a vision. And I had the opportunity to do that as well. So I was lucky in the sense that I was able to build a lot of what I wanted within my current job. I also obviously had a journalism and PR experience, and there was no marketing or media department at Universum at the time. And so I even had the hat of media relations executive on the side where I would build, you know, the PR strategy and so on and so forth. So again, I was lucky in the sense that because it was a very entrepreneurial organization, whatever it is that I wanted to do, 
I could do it and I could do it full force and fully supported. I see. But, you know, I can imagine that if I had been in an organization that has, you know, greater structure or that is perhaps larger, you know, I would have had to work or fight harder to carve that space for myself. But I did. I mean, I definitely, I continued writing. I mean, obviously being a journalist and being in touch with many different aspects of life was always a key area for me. So I continued to do that and collaborate with different medias. You know, I also developed a strong passion with harmonizing the multi-generational workforce, which wasn't really a universal solution at the time. And so I had the freedom and flexibility to pursue this thought leadership on my own and start to kind of build advocacy around it. And then, of course, any opportunity that was thrown my way, no matter what department it was from, what country it was from, what context it was from, I would just jump on it and get it. No, absolutely. What I'm hearing is immense curiosity and willingness to dig in any area that comes your way and any project that comes your way because it broadens your horizon and you never know. You open one door, many other doors open after that. Who knows? Absolutely. That's really a great (laughs) approach. Let's go to the moment when you decided that your corporate life, if I can say that, is over and you want to go ahead and do your own thing. How did it happen? So how did it happen? I mean, I think it was a little progressive. One of the things that I love the most about my 16-year career is that when I joined the company, It was a very, very pivotal or very particular time in history because what happened is that in 2005, 2006, all millennials were undergraduates, or I should say all undergraduates fell under the millennial generation. And all the MBAs and the master's uh, students fell on the Gen X generation. And I, at the time, was running the consulting department, and I was a interim research head. And I remember that when we did this survey, as I mentioned, Universal used to do this, this really big survey across the world to understand the preferences of talent coming out of universities and what they expect out of their job, and then, you know, the ideal employer rankings and all that. I remember that when I had received the first data set that year, I was extremely concerned that there had been some errors in the data processing because the data was completely different between millennials and Gen X. So when I looked at what millennials wanted, they wanted the Peace Corps, they wanted Teach for America, they wanted flexibility and friendly environment, they wanted work-life balance, they self-identified with every diverse attribute that they could think of. And then when I looked at the data from the Gen Xers, just a couple of years down the line, my generations, they didn't want to self-identify with anything. They wanted to work for financial services and accounting and management consulting. They valued money, prestige, and leadership. And I remember as a journalist, and this is another example how your careers can intertwine, I looked at this data and I thought, this is incredible. I mean, if this data is accurate, there is such a huge story here and there is such potential to change the world by actually bringing the story to life and kind of amplify it to the world. And so I decided to become this kind of millennial ambassador where I started working with organizations to say, hey guys, there's an entire new generation here who wants things to be different and you guys do want to win the war for talent, right? You'll no longer be able to attract talent on the basis of a strong brand or a strong salary. So it's time to change. And so I had the opportunity to start working with hundreds of organizations from your investment banks to your tech companies, to your best moving consumer goods companies, to your CIAs and NASAs to really help them understand how to transform their working environment to cater to the need of millennials. And I really felt, aside from my daily job, which was obviously, you know, to support organizations and helping build talent strategy, but I really felt that I was playing a very important part, maybe small, but important in transforming the world of work. And as you know, Ani, I mentioned how miserable I was when I started working and I was treated horribly. I wasn't encouraged to socialize. I wasn't encouraged to do anything. I was punished for trying to chat with my colleagues because I was reminded that I was there to work and not to chit chat. So, you know, for me, the idea that, you know, organizations could take these generations seriously and start to create an environment where young people can express themselves 
you know, became a bit of a life mission for me, if I have to be honest. So I started doing a lot of work on the side while working with Universal, obviously, and while representing them with generational experts to further understand this generation and the impact of them. And if we fast forward, I think 15 years, we can see that the workplace is very different now than what it was when me or you as well joined the workplace. Oh, absolutely. Nothing in common. Nothing. I mean, people now can take for granted that I mean, can you imagine you or I, for example, choosing an employer on the basis of whether our boss would be flexible enough or whether we would be able to bring our pet to work or have healthy food in a pantry? I mean, suffering through having a job and dealing with your boss's bad moods was kind of part of the job description, right? So I was very passionate. I decided to kind of spearhead this movement and convince governments and companies to incorporate and employ running strategies into workforce planning. And it got to a point where I think all of this came full circle and the workplace revolution had happened. And now the majority of people, at least in emerging and developed markets who enter the workplace can expect to be somewhat understood, can expect to be coached, yeah. to be mentored, to be trained and developed and to be valued for their diversity, right? And so for me, it kind of felt like an era was coming to the end. And from then on, it was not so much about changing things or driving change. It was more about supporting organizations with their talent strategy and with implementing certain programs. But the big bulk of the transformation had already happened. Mm -hmm. And this is what I actually started to realize that there was actually a huge opportunity now that millennials had flooded the workplace to help generations get along, collaborate efficiently and drive change together. And I started becoming really passionate about this topic. And I was lucky because the owner of Universal gave me the freedom and flexibility to pursue that passion outside of my daily job. So I started really becoming an advocate for intergenerational collaboration. And then at some point, you know, the organization was acquired. You know, I didn't feel that I could drive as big of an impact or big of a change. And I wanted to move on to the next thing. And right at that time, Gen Z entered the workplace and I started engaging with this new generation and finding out and realizing how driven to purpose they are and how much they want to drive change from a societal standpoint. And I thought, okay, I worked with millennials to drive a workplace revolution. How about now I try to support these Gen Zs in bringing about the next change, which is going to be linked to purpose and impact. You know, this is a generation that wants to enter organizations and wants to save the world. They want to work on meaningful projects. They want to make an impact. And if I can bridge the generational divide and ensure that this generation can enter the workplace with this desire to save the world and can be supported and embraced by the existing workforce, then I think our world is in a much better place. And of course, you know, this thought came together with three pregnancies and three babies and the idea that, you know, I need to do something that's more meaningful for my children. And so I think that's when I started deciding and realizing that this is the next movement and the next wave that I wanted to ride or maybe even spearhead. And because in life, nothing, nothing happens, you know, that is not meant to. And then equally so everything happens that is meant to. The opportunity to write a book about the topic sort of fell on my lap. And that's when I realized that, okay, this is a sign. You know, I just realized that this is what I want to do and this opportunity comes and I'm going to take it. I had no plan B. I had, frankly, I was not in a position, you know, financially and otherwise to really take such a big leap and give up a 16-year career salary yeah. and so on. But it just felt right. And that's kind of me. I'm a bit of a risk taker. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And now as an entrepreneur, What were you prepared for and what were you not prepared for? Well, what was I prepared for and not prepared for? Well, I think one of the benefits of kind of going with the flow and jumping into things without giving it much thought is that you don't really need a plan to define your success or your lack of success. The more kind of fluid you are to a certain extent, although of course you need to have your goal in mind, the less likely you are to experience setbacks that mess that plan because the plan is really quite fluid from the beginning. So for me, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what I realized is that I had to depend on myself. You know, it was the first time that I actually got a chance to work with clients, with organizations, with a market as me. I mean, I had always been kind of, you know, the brand and the face of the organization in Asia and within this particular topic and field. But, you know, all of a sudden it was me. And I think this was a very empowering feeling and one that actually gave me a lot of strength to continue and to pursue it. But obviously it wasn't easy. I mean, the first step for me was to write the book. And I was given a six-month deadline from my publisher, McGraw-Hill, to start the book and finish it. 
And I'm someone who works really well in under very high pressure situation and very chaotic environment. So I thought, ah, you know, it's January. I need to deliver it around August time frame. You know, I can take some time. I'm going to start working on this around March. That way I feel the pressure and I can, you know, get it doing and, and so on. And then what happened is COVID happened. <laughs> and in Singapore, I found myself locked at home for two and a half months with a six month old baby, a one and a half year old baby, a four year old baby, my Bulgarian mother in law served at my six month notice, who doesn't speak English, by the way, and I don't speak any Bulgarian. So that was interesting in and of itself. Uh, while serving a six month notice with Universum, having to, to cope. Yeah. And survive this pandemic and survive, you know, my husband's lack of ability to focus because he had to work at home surrounded by kids. And and it was hard. It was really hard, Ani, I have to say. And there's a few times where I actually sat down and thought, oh, my, my gosh, how am I going to be able to do this? I just don't have the mental capacity to deal with this. And this is where my husband was extremely supported, actually. And one day I sat down and I said, you know, I don't know what to do during this lockdown. I won't be able to write. I just can't do it. And I don't know, like, how else can I use my time? And he reminded me that, hey, you know, you've always been the voice of the industry. Why not take this opportunity to check in with leaders that you've worked with in the past and see how they're experiencing the topic? And so I actually started having a lot of incredible conversations with incredible business leaders. And I have to be honest, if COVID hadn't happened, my book probably would not be a bestseller because what made it great was the fact that I was able to develop an entire new idea and perspective about the topic just by talking to people. And my plan was not to do that initially. And so I just, you know, absorbed all this incredible information. The day that, you know, lockdown ended, I rushed to the American Club, which is my home away from home, and spent three months from June 8th until August 30th every single day just writing down writing down writing down everything that I you know that was just throwing through my head and I was able to deliver the book and of course I've always been one of those people that is wants to take ownership of what is mine and at the same time doesn't want to take credit for what isn't so I had made the deal with McGraw-Hill that I would write the book on the condition that I would be the copy editor as well so the book would not be altered in any way yeah and i also took ownership of the cover and i took ownership of the graphic design and so it was really a hundred percent me project and then once the book was done you know i had learned so much and i had the opportunity to start talking about this topic in so many different places that then potential for collaboration for products for engagements just started finding me so i never really mm -hmm. found myself in a position where i had to go out and, and seek the business or it just started i was just passionately talking about something that i thought would be incredibly impactful and i just started to realize that opportunities came to me from you know radio stations that wanted to feature the topic to tv stations to podcasters to articles to clients that wanted me to talk about it internally and little by little by taking every single opportunity and making the best out of it i was able to wake up one day you know a year a year and a half later and realize that i have a company which is actually working really well. And it's exciting. I don't know, sometimes like, I really can't believe it, to be honest. But it just happened in a very kind of natural, natural way. I, in a way. You know, I, I think I can maybe share a story. And I think this is at the foundation of my belief in life a little bit. When I was graduating from journalism, the last day before our graduation date, I was sitting with a professor uh, in one of my classes. And the professor was saying, hey, you guys are going to get a graduation tomorrow. So what are you guys going to do? And everybody around the table was saying, well, I mean, of course, I'm going to become a reporter for the New York Times and I'm going to write for the Houston Chronicle and I'm going to become a PR exec. And when it came down to me, I had no idea on it. And I remember that I said, <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I don't even know if I will be in the U.S. in a month because I'm actually contemplating going back home. And I remember my professor made fun of me nicely, you know, sweetly. But he said, ah, and he started calling me the one who, hasn't, who doesn't have it figured out. And I was okay because at the end of the day, I never thought that a plan or a career was going to define me anyways. I knew that there was something, you know, there and I knew that somehow it would unroll or you know, unveil. And so I went back to Italy with no idea. And I was actually talking to my stepfather one day and he said, you know, Rachel, it's okay. You know, I've always been a little skeptical of this youth that comes in thinking they've got it all figured out. Because at the end of the day, when you have an idea in mind, yes, it helps you stay on track. But at the same time, sometimes it makes you blind and deaf to the opportunities yeah. that life presents. And if you're so fixed on one thing, 
You may be fixed on something that is not the right thing because you have limited experience in life and you may miss all the cues and all those opportunities to pivot and perhaps find something better. So he said, don't worry about it. You know, you'll figure it out. And so I think, you know, that was something that stayed with me, you know, all throughout my life. I was never the person that had to write the outline for the book or have a plan for my life or have a plan B or plan C. I had a vision and I just gave life an opportunity to kind of direct me, you know, in one way or another. And in following those cues, I think in the end of the day has always managed to bring me exactly where I needed to be. So, yeah. <laughs> No, it's absolutely amazing. And we're at the end of the podcast and I was planning to actually ask you what are your key takeaways for the listeners, but you just said it, you know, you just said it not in uh, three words, but in a story, a very simple story that it is okay that sometimes you have not figured it out yet and you don't know what is in in the future, but that's okay, right? Yeah. You can still succeed and you can still become somebody who is important in this world that is changing the world. Yeah. And Anani, I agree with that. I mean, if I, you know, had decided to make decisions or make choices on the basis of having very clear and distinct ideas, I wouldn't have studied journalism. I wouldn't have moved back to Italy. I wouldn't have ended up in an advertising agency and then a consulting agency and then CNBC, and then waiting tables again. And going back to an extremely humbling experience and then taking the first flight out to Philadelphia without really knowing what was in store for me. I definitely wouldn't have left my company because if I had actually sat down and planned it out, I would have realized that it was you know, a big risk. You know, I feel that sometimes the world tries to tell us that we need to have it all figured out. And the reality is that most of us don't. And even when we think we have it figured out, yeah. very often we have it figured out by someone else's standards, right? So, you know, I think in these moments where somebody's lost, the best thing you can do to some extent is just continue to believe that there's something and try to feel what that something is. And then just listen to cues, you know, take chances. And I don't know, I just have that feeling that what is meant for you will always find you. And that we should also be thankful for all the closed doors because they protect us from places that are not meant for us. So yeah, I guess trust in life. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. I wish you absolutely all the best. Thank you very much for being my guest. Thank you so much, Ani. It has been such a pleasure. And you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. And my pleasure, really, entirely. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Change is Possible podcast. I hope you enjoyed. If there is any topic that you're interested in or would like to nominate a guest, please drop me a message via LinkedIn. Have a great day. Bye.